here is where the issue of intellectual property and uh, access to medicines come back again. In the, in the case of HIV AIDS, as, as you surely know, the main issue was about patents, uh, the existence of some patents, on, including some repurposing of products. Uh, there was the case of AZT, it was a second medical use that actually pose a barrier for the access uh, to medicines. But then on this issue, there are two visions. One vision has been uh, expressed by, um, by the Secretary General of the United Nations, who has said, and I quote, these new tools, he's referring to tools to address the COVID-19, must be a very clear and essential example of a global public good. So essentially the concept is that these technologies and the tools, the products should be a global public good. This is a concept that the South Center has also used in a letter that we sent to the Director General of the World Organization, WIPO and WTO, arguing for this concept to be the basis of any further development or work in this area. But there is another, another vision that has been expressed by the Director General of WIPO, who has said, and again I quote, it does not appear to be any evidence that intellectual property is a barrier to access. Focusing on access may not, not only represent a misunderstanding of the sequencing of innovation and access, but also create a disincentive to investment in needed innovation. So as you can see, there are two very different visions. Um, paradoxically, WIPO is a UN agency specialized in the area of intellectual property, but seems to keep the, the old concept that intellectual property is an end in itself and that access is a secondary issue, uh, while innovation without access does not make any sense. So, as I mentioned in the case of uh, HIV AIDS, the main issue was about patents. In the case of uh, COVID-19, patents are uh, an important issue, uh, of course, again. But let me mention here two aspects, two dimensions in relation to patent protection. The first one is uh, the protection of what, what is called a second medical use of an existing medicine. As you, as you know, there are many medicines. We have been tested recently, existing medicines, uh, to see whether they could provide some treatment in relation to COVID-19. For sure, there will be attempts by, by companies uh, to get what is called a second medical use patent. That means to get a new patent on the new use of an existing medicine. In some countries, these, these patents or these kind of claims are allowed. But let me just emphasize that this is not required under CHIPS agreement. And there is no reason whatsoever under the basic principles of patent law to grant these kind of claims because these claims do not comply with the key requirement of novelty. They do not comply with industrial applicability because in essence they are methods of treatment. There is no industrial applicability and therefore there is no reason whatsoever to grant these kind of claims. Now, the second dimension, of course, will be the um, applications for uh, eventually new medicines and more in particular, more, more particularly in the case of new vaccines. Um, so this will be one of the main issues that at the global scale there will be a need to deal with. In addition to this, uh, there will be no only patents that may create barriers to access to uh, technologies and medicines. There will be also the issue of data exclusivity in those countries, particularly those who have signed free trade agreements in which uh, test data are subject to exclusive rights or same exclusive rights. So these rights may also pose a, a limitation for the availability of technologies and products. There might be issues in connection with know-how, in particular for devices, um, also in relation to designs. So in, in the case of COVID-19, what I'm just trying to indicate, the intellectual property comes into, into the picture with a broader scope. It's not only about patents, which for instance also have been applied for and enforced in some countries in relation to masks, not only to medicines, but um, other, other areas in the, in, the, in the field of intellectual property may be concerned. 
So this means that we need uh, a broad, a broad understanding of the barriers that intellectual property may uh, may create. So now, um, so I intend to be short. Um, so what actions can the government take? What the international community can do uh, from a practical point of view in order to address this uh, critical situation, not only health situation, economic situation. Of course, there are many actions that can be taken at the national level. The first one I already mentioned is that um, governments should uh, instruct their patent offices not to grant uh, second medical use patents, no obligation to do that, and it is, as I mentioned, contrary to the basic principles of patent. Secondly, I think governments should uh, apply rigorous standards for the examination of patent applications. As you know, um, this is an issue in which there is a lot of diversity at the world level. There are some countries that apply rigorous um, requirements, as the case of Egypt, the case of Argentina, and other countries, uh, and other another patent office apply very lax uh, requirements. So in this in this situation, this may this may lead to the creation of what is what is called patent thicket, a large number of patents around the basic technology that will prevent uh, most likely uh, access to that technology and then the availability, which is essential of uh, products at uh, affordable prices. There are other flexibilities, but uh, Viviana Munoz will make a reference uh, later to this on the basis of the policy brief paper that she has just published, uh, such as prior importation. But it is important to, uh, to emphasize that governments have tools, in most laws they are provided for. In some cases, there may be a need to, uh, to introduce amendments. So some countries have already done, including developed countries, such as the case of Canada and Germany, they have, there have been also has, there has been also a reform in December last year in the case of Argentina. So governments can act fast and introduce changes, for instance, in order to make compulsory licensing government use, which is an important tool um, uh, usable in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fast way, in an efficient way. So on this, let me just make a little propaganda. Uh, the South Center has just published a guide on the use of compulsory license and government use for non-commercial purposes, which might be helpful in designing reforms to the laws or in applying the existing laws. The second alternative that uh, governments have, which is provided for under Article 73B of the CHIPS Agreement, is the security clause. This also in GATT. So under this clause that um, was not re really very much looked at, every W2 member can suspend obligations under the CHIPS agreement. So this means that any obligation in relation to the protection, to the granting of rights, in relation to the enforcement of rights can be suspended on the basis of security reasons. And one of the specific uh, cases that Article 73B refers to is the case of an international emergency. Uh, this is not an international emergency. What, what is that? So this is another, another possibility that can be used. So there is no need to request any authorization from, um, from WTO or the WTO conference. So this can be just invoked by, by uh, the states uh, seriously and on very good grounds. So, as you may know, recently the United States used the security, national security clause in an abusive manner in order to uh, prevent importation of aluminum steel from some countries. But this, is, this was just an example of an abusive use. Instead, in the case that we are facing now, Article 73B can, in a very legitimate manner, be involved by uh, members of WTO. So a third, a third alternative has been, has been discussed right now is to uh, negotiate in WTO a moratorium or what is called sometimes a peace clause, meaning that there will be a commitment by WTO members not to uh, submit complaints in the case that intellectual property rights are not uh, granted or enforced, enforced in accordance with um, the uh, TRIPS agreement. 
So this is an alternative, uh, but um, unlike Article 73B, in the case of uh, such a moratorium, there will be a need to negotiate this moratorium with all members of WTO. And we can expect, of course, that some members may oppose. And as you know, the rule under WTO is consensus and it will be sufficient for one member to object to, uh, to, block, to, block, to block, the block this moratorium might be that uh, in WTO you don't get anything without paying for it. So there is always a, a quid pro quo. So therefore, if there, if there was a submission by developing countries eventually uh, for, to get this moratorium, they would have to pay a price. For instance, in terms of the e-commerce moratorium, that may, may deprive uh, governments from very needed income on the basis of taxation of e-commerce transactions that, as you know, are increasing exponentially these days. So there will be price to be paid for uh, this moratorium. And, and the, the third problem is that since the, the conference, the WTO conference will not take place in probably during this year, so it, there will be no forum in order to negotiate this uh, moratorium in, the, in a timely manner. So this is something that uh, needs to be considered. And then the fourth um, the approach I would like to mention is um, the implementation of the proposal made by the president of Costa Rica, which is a welcome proposal, to create a repository of information with free access or licensing on reasonable and affordable terms of the technologies and data, know-how, etc., which are necessary, may be necessary in order to address COVID-19. Um, this, this, uh, this proposal is based on the idea of um, putting into practice an, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, that will uh, establish the, um, the commitments by governments, eventually by, by, by companies. So this is not, uh, it has not been implemented yet. Uh, however, the idea has, has received quite significant support. Um, the Director General of the World Health Organization indicated his support to this initiative. The same UNITAID in has also uh, indicated his support. A large number of NGOs have also supported this initiative. So the point now is, is therefore how this can be implemented in a way that is effective. This will this may be discussed in the in the forthcoming World Health Assembly. In, uh, for which it will be very important for uh, developing countries and all those pushing for a global solution to this problem to make their own submission in order to ensure that this initiative and others actually uh, can be achieved. Um, again, I think the underlying principle should be the concept of a global public goods and this should be seen as one of the possible ways, one of the possible instruments in order to achieve that objective um, without prejudice of the use of other instruments uh, I mentioned before, as, such as uh, compulsory licensing, government use, or Article 70, 73B of the uh, TRIPS agreement. So one, one, one issue, important issue in relation to uh, this proposal uh, will be to ensure that um, if this pool of knowledge is actually established, it should have a global reach, uh, as we know, and despite the efforts made by the medicines patent pool and the very effective work that they have done in getting license from a significant number of companies, in most cases, companies retain some markets, the most profitable markets for them. And therefore, the issue of getting uh, the medicines uh, to all has also been a, a challenge in the context of this, uh, of the, of this organization. But then, in, 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 su in summary, uh, the proposals, uh, the proposal I've mentioned, and the other instruments uh, can be used. They are not mutually exclusive. All of them need to be on the table, uh, including in order for the companies eventually uh, to realize that the governments can use the instruments, uh, whether voluntary or non-voluntary, in order to address public health objectives. So, Thank you, Professor Correa. So uh, just to note, uh, we are taking note of the questions that are being um, asked. Uh, we will um, try to gather all of these. And then after I make what will be a short presentation, um, then we can go through uh, the questions. 
Um, so I'm mindful of the time, so I'll also be trying to summarize, and I'll just mention that um, the, the paper I'm referring to is the policy brief number 73 of April 2020, um, which uh, I authored, and it's called the CODIV-19 Pandemic R&D Intellectual Property Management for Access to Diagnostics, Medicines, and Vaccines. Um, in addition to that, we have a number of additional resources um, that you can find both on our website and also on a specific website, which is called iprcesstomedicines.int. Um, um, and there we will find a number of resources on CODIV-related um, uh, issue areas on intellectual property. So um, I'd just like to start by um, highlighting then um, the common points um, that were made uh, for our, our general South Center view on the relationship between um, the urgency of CODIV uh, response and the role of intellectual property or addressing the effects of intellectual property protection. Um, so as we mentioned, um, the, there are many challenges uh, with regards to addressing the CODIV-19 pandemic. Um, and one of them is that there is extreme urgency in response. So clearly um, the response has to do um, first from the health perspective um, with addressing the issues of the necessary isolation detect detection of cases. So here we find important role for technologies and diagnostics and testing kits, as well as in um, general um, equipment so that is necessary in hospitals for protection of health workers, um, also for treatments such as ventilators and so forth. Um, then we would ideally um, already have um, some preventive measure um, against uh, CODIV-19, but unfortunately we're not there yet. There is no vaccine at the moment. So this is also a, a, a clear urgency um, is to um, have a soon access to an effective vaccine. And on the other hand, we still don't have any effective treatments yet that have, are sufficiently supported by um, large clinical trial results to tell us that these are effective treatments. Um, so the urgency of response on the one hand, of course, has to do with the, with the um, adequate um, health response um, that is being given. Um, and on the other hand, we have the huge economic impact that the COVID-19 pandemic is having. And this is really relevant because in many parts of the world, the particular containment measures, for example, of isolation and continued um, um, having the health work, uh, the, the overall um, working population in pause um, is extremely um, debilitating for the livelihoods of billions of people around the world. And in particular, in developing country um, contexts, um, it will be very difficult to keep this kind of mechanism. So, so far, it's, it's proven important um, in containing um, the, the spread, but this will not be a measure that can be taken long term. So there is clear urgency um, for having preventive and, and treatment measures that come into developing countries as soon as possible. Um, and so based on this, uh, we note that there is both the economic crisis together with the health crisis, um, the impact of having no income can be hitting um, livelihoods quite directly in addition to the health impact of, of uh, being infected with the, with the COVID-19 virus. Now, with regards to this huge challenge, um, in addition to the urgency, we have different factors. We don't have a situation as usual. We have an enormous demand, so these technologies are now um, carrying a large demand. This is quite different when we just look at innovation theory and the role of intellectual property, where we um, theoretically consider that intellectual property can be potentially important incentive in dealing with the sluggish demand, for example, in vaccines, and that therefore there is this need to have these additional incentives in addition to others. Um, so not only for addressing appropriability concerns, but also with regards, for example, of need for additional push of, of financing to address other market failures, in particular for vaccines. So we have large demand. We know that there is gonna be a need for enormous manufacturing capacity. Um, and so these are unique circumstances. We also know that there is an uh, increasing amount of financing being put forward from governments. So we saw the Accelerate Act um, pledge um, which is increasing commitment starting with the European level, um, you know, over 8 billion committed, um, and this is likely to grow. So we have these additional um, environment for innovation that allows us to think differently. And here is then how do we place the IP challenge? 
So with regards to the IP challenge, as was mentioned, um, on the one hand, we can continue to promote voluntary initiatives and telling all uh, potential um, IP right holders uh, to consider putting these technologies and importantly, critically, also information um, as well as know-how in the public domain, share it openly. Um, scientists have been uh, taking a lead on this and increasing collaboration. Um, so we can do that, but does this address the urgency of what we need now? We need to know what technologies are out there already, what could be useful. With the patent information, we already have a problem with regards to the time lag. As you know, patent information usually um, will be made available after some time when, in, when this uh, patent application has gone through. Um, it could be 18 month process. So we do have face a time lag with regards to the patent information that may be available in any case. Um, so considering this also, um, as was mentioned, um, the idea of generating a general pool where this can be done um, is also important. At the same time, we have to see of what governments can do as well in those situations, as Professor Correa mentioned, um, when we need uh, to have access to the technologies that are being made available, and in particular to scale up manufacturing capacity. Um, so we know that this um, requires also um, associated uh, technology transfer and know-how. So we need to work in parallel, um, ensuring that these are available. So what are some of the tools um, that, that we have? Well, um, importantly, to be able to also support the use of, of the uh, intellectual property flexibilities with regards to um, this emergency situation, um, we should have a support infrastructure as well as to have more information of what technology is out there. So that's just important to note that we should be having these spaces more openly and that's part of what's being requested from organizations like WHO. But what we would also like to see from organizations such as WIPO providing much more open information about technologies that are already out there and not some, you know, there is some patent scope information, but this is not helping us order about what technologies are available openly already and how can these be used. Um, why would that be increasingly helpful? For example, if we look at efforts through medspal.org um, or through lens.org, um, this will help us um, as well then identify where are the critical areas where governments should be implementing um, these mechanisms. For example, um, if we consider compulsory licensing, um, then it will be very important to already have more access to this information um, of what are the status of different patent applications around the world. Um, with that, um, I'll come now to uh, just highlight the, the details of additional TRIPS flexibilities with regards to intellectual property that will be important to keep in that menu of, of government um, intellectual uh, property tools that can be used in accordance to the TRIPS agreement, so in full compliance with the legal international frameworks, um, to be able to access technologies as they become available. Um, Prior to that, just to mention that the IP challenge is very real. I think uh, Professor Correa highlighted that, but we do want to mention that again, as some other um, mentions have been made that perhaps this is not the time to focus on the IP challenge. Um, and we do consider that, you know, highlighting the urgency of the response. Um, we, we should not allow more time likes happening um, prior to considering what might be um, the problems in this area. And we already have uh, examples of where this is problematic. We do have many manufacturers already concerned about potential infringement um, and then what cases may come against them. And this has happened, even the cases of producing um, valves for ventilators in Italy. Um, this has happened as well with efforts to um, make uh, copies of N95, for example, um, and masks of and ventilator technology. Um, so we know that there are technologies that are proprietary right now and that if we had um, uh, shared access um, where patents were not an obstacle at the moment, then we would be having um, increased capacity for manufacturing around the world for these essential goods. Um, so I will just highlight um, that in the area for um, the application of of non-voluntary licenses, which can be granted by governments. Um, we have uh, included additional resources, um, as was mentioned. We have a recent guide for compulsory licensing. So it explains um, in more detail what would be the appropriate steps in accordance to the TRIPS agreement um, to, uh, to follow this process, um, starting from um, how you can find assistance to identify what are the uh, patents that would pose barriers. Um, and then from there identifying 
um, what are the mechanisms that can be used um, to go ahead. In terms of revising legislation, this is something that we provide help with. Um, you might, um, uh, it might be important to note that um, most countries in the world already have some form of legal provision authorizing for compulsory licensing in their patent laws. And um, for example, WIPO has compiled um, recently at the request of, of countries and the Standing Committee on Patents, a full listing of those legislations. So this is not something that is not common to developed and developed countries. Um, what we are seeing are increasing efforts of countries to accelerate um, the process, uh, what would be requirements, procedural requirements for um, issuing compulsory license. They are trying to mainstream this to facilitate. So for example, in the case of Canada recently, um, they have made a bill which um, facilitates, in the case of compulsory licensing, that the, the negotiation for settling of adequate remuneration um, compensation for the compulsory license, um, that that can be done um, after uh, the use has, has started through the compulsory license. And so um, just to think about if there is a need to revise to, to try to simplify procedures, that would be useful considering uh, the moment of urgency. Um, and of course, within compulsory license, um, there is government non-commercial use that allows um, stream, um, stream uh, or um, facilitating um, this process further. Other important uh, flexibilities to think about um, is, of course, in the case of um, parallel importation is um, where co many countries will not have the capacity for, to manufacture locally, um, but uh, there is important need to consider other options for procurement. And parallel importation um, would allow that uh, patented protected products that might be um, available um, through third countries at a lower price could be imported um, uh, for domestic procurement. Other important um, flexibilities have to do with facilitating um, the research process through the research and development pipeline. Um, so for example, the research exception to ensure that um, scientists, uh, researchers can be uh, um, researching uh, with regards to patent technology without um, being subject to infringement or in the case of um, potential generic manufacturers that they can already be um, uh, using uh, patented technology uh, for the purpose of later obtaining regulatory approval um, to do this through uh, what is known as the Bowler exemption. Um, so other important um, flexibilities we have is with regards, for example, um, to the extent of the exclusivities that are granted um, and some trips uh, uh, plus uh, requirements and free trade agreements can, um, can limit this, for example, with extending um, uh, uh, exclusivity of, of uh, certain data that is required prior to registration of medical products. Um, so we think it's important to try to um, uh, keep uh, uh, the, the regulations in accordance to the TRIPS agreements, but avoiding these um, overall TRIPS plus processes, especially at this moment when there's still many trade negotiations taking place. And we've noticed, for example, the United States that is currently still in trade negotiations has not made any um, commitment yet that these will not be pursued, European Union as well. And we think that this is also an important area where this should not happen. Um, so given the time that we have several questions, I will not go further um, in any of those details and hopefully we can detail more of some of this discussion through the Q&A. Um,